Thank you so much, Marcia. Thank you, Bobby. Wow. Aren't you glad you came to church now? I'm glad I came to church. Just be reminded that Jesus loves me. Thank you for singing to fall in love with Jesus again. Just to remember what a glorious, glorious God we serve. We are two weeks out from Easter. And I want to remind you that two weeks from today is Easter. In case any of you have forgotten, two weeks from today is Easter. And we're not going to be having the 845 service in two weeks. In two weeks, we're only having a 10 a.m. service. A 10 a.m. service is going to be out in the park. We're going to have everything set up. We're only doing one service this year. We're not doing the 1030 service. We're not doing the 845 service. We're only doing one 10 a.m. service. And how many people are you supposed to bring each? Ten people each. That's exactly right. You're supposed to bring ten people each. Now you know that ahead of time. Now just out of the 50 or 60 of us here right now, that's five or six hundred people. And all we have to do is be faithful. You don't have to go to a cross. You don't have to die. You don't have to be nailed to it. You don't have to do any of that. All you have to do is be faithful and bring 10 people with you on that day. And then if each, each of us bring us, imagine what a mind-blowing experience it would be to walk into the park on Easter Sunday and have 1,000 people out there. I venture to say there has never been a service at Central Community. I know there hasn't been in the last 31 years with 1,000 people at it. And I know in this building there's never been 1,000 people, so that's before we built the park. So I think, what a glorious thing, but even more, how cool it would be to think, look at that, Don brought 10. Look at that, Terry brought 10. Look at that, Carolyn brought 10. And to think, everyone actually did it and got involved and followed through on that. Now, many of you know my mother-in-law died this past week. Thank you so much for those of you who've been praying for us. For those of you who didn't know my mother-in-law, Debbie's mom, Sylvia, she passed away Thursday morning. She'd been a member of Central Community for 20, 25 years, an awfully long time. This is Debbie's last parent to lose, and her brother died 12 years ago, so this is, Debbie's kind of on her own now. But she, my mom said she was the last one in her family, and I remember when her last sibling died, she called me and said, well, the cheese stands alone. And that's what Debbie had said to us, said to me the other night, but we were ready for it. I mean, the hospice worker had told us a couple weeks ago, said, well, you know, when she dies, do you want us to call you at any time? Because it could be 2 o'clock in the morning. We said, of course. You know, we want you. So Wednesday night, we had left about 9 or 10 o'clock, and the evening mom was real bad. She was real bad this past Wednesday. And so we'd gone to bed, and we had set clothes out. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, the phone rang. Now, nobody needed to tell us what they were going to be saying on the phone knew exactly what the news was. And for each of us, there's a phone call that will come. And it won't be about your mother-in-law. It won't be about someone else. It won't be about a friend. I'm giving you the news right now. For every single person that you know and love that you don't share Jesus Christ with between now and that day that the phone call comes, you see, my mother-in-law, she used to sit right over there in church. My mother-in-law, when it was Communion Sunday, she would be right up here. And if she knew it was Communion Sunday, she'd come in and she'd wax all the pews. My mother-in-law, when it was time for her to go, I knew exactly where she was headed. I had zero doubt, zero doubt. With confidence, I prayed for three days, Lord, please let mom go home. Please just take her sooner as opposed to later, with great confidence. And for each of us, we have those we love, those we care about, and yet those we don't share Jesus with, that we'll find out about this telephone call. And you're saying, boy, Pastor Eric, you're laying it on pretty thick. You're getting on here pretty guilty. You must really want that church built. Friends, it does, I do not get a raise, I do not get a promotion, I do not get a bonus star, I don't get an extra piece of German chocolate cake from Gene, I don't get any of that kind of stuff if the park is filled on Easter Sunday. And I don't eat German chocolate cake anymore anyway, but I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. 
None of that kind of stuff. But what we all get is the joy of knowing that look what we shared in together. Look at the joy of what it means to know someone at 2 o'clock in the morning when they get called, it's going to be a call of confidence, even in the midst of the grief. And we have the opportunity. We've been talking about what it means to be lifted up. The theme verse for the series, some of you should know by heart, by now it's from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, the 32nd verse. It's Jesus speaking, and he says, And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all peoples unto myself. It's at the top of your card that's inside your program this morning on a beautiful piece of art. It says, And I, Jesus speaking, if I be lifted up, I will draw all peoples unto myself. Now, how many people does Jesus say will he'll draw unto himself? All people. If he is lifted up. Now, the Gospel of John goes on to say, well, this is what Jesus is talking about in the manner of death that he will die. But Jesus says, if, I, if I'm lifted up onto the cross, is what the extension of that is, I will draw all people unto myself. Does that mean that everybody's going to follow Jesus? Does that mean that everyone's going to choose to go to the cross? What it means is that he's going to offer himself up as an invitation for every single one of us. And we have the opportunity to join in that glorious lifted up. Last week, we talked about what it meant to be lifted up to see Jesus. And about how the Greeks came to Philip and Maybe it was just because of his name, and they asked him, hey, we want to see Jesus. Philip didn't know what to do, so Philip went to Andrew. Andrew, these guys want to see Jesus. What should we do? Andrew was smart enough to know, I don't know, but let's go talk to Jesus about it. And friends, when you don't have the answer, at least be smart enough to know, well, we can always talk to Jesus about this. And to go to Jesus about this, and then this is what happened, because this morning I want to talk with you about being lifted up to share Jesus. Because when you're lifted up in life, have you ever considered that the only reason Marcia was given that glorious voice was to share Jesus? I mean, was for this moment, this morning, for one of us, like me maybe, who really needed that hope today, I mean, to share Jesus? Have you ever thought that maybe the glorious gift that you've been given, you think, well, I worked hard for this gift, Pastor. You know, I did this myself. You know, have you ever thought that maybe whatever, whatever it is, that you have in your life, it was so that you could share Jesus? And what if you have that, and then you fail to utilize it for what it was worth? See, one of the glorious invitations of being in the presence of art like this, when someone like Marcia sings, is that she is laying it down for Jesus. I mean, is that, that's what's happening. We have the opportunity to be in the middle of that. Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all peoples unto myself, and then we get to share Jesus. So what is Jesus going to say to these Greek guys? They've come to Philip. They've come to Andrew. Andrew says, let's go to Jesus. And it says, and Jesus answered them. So now this is what Jesus says, and that's where we pick up today. John 12, verses 23 through 25. It says, Jesus replied. If you go back to the King James, it says, and Jesus answered them. Whichever translation you're in, it says something along these lines. This is a New Living Translation. Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. These Greeks must be thinking, hang on a second, we just wanted to meet Jesus. Hang on a second, what kind of answer is this? I mean, they get Philip, they get Andrew, they finally come to Jesus, and Jesus answers them, and he says, I tell you the truth, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. What's he saying here in modern-day English? You know how I've been telling you up until now, now is not my time, now is not my time? What I'm telling you now, now is my time. Now is the moment. This is the time, tell everyone. Should you bring these Greek guys here? Bring them on in. Now is the time, tell everyone. We're walking into Jerusalem. Easter's about to happen. 
It's about to be that horrible Good Friday. And it's about to be that incredible first celebration of the resurrection. And in that moment, he says, I tell you the truth. The Son of Man is about to be glorified. And then, and then he goes on to say, unless you take a kernel of wheat and you plant it in the ground and it dies, it'll remain all alone. We all understand that. If you take a seed, you leave it in a drawer, you never plant it, how much are you ever going to get from that seed? Nothing. I've got a bunch of watermelon seeds my grandmother mailed me when I was a kid back in 1965. I still have them in the envelope at home that she mailed them to me from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm guessing I could still plant them. I don't know. I hold on to them because I was 11 years old and I actually remember buying the watermelon that my grandmother took them from. <laughs> My grandmother's been dead since 1972, and they're a precious memory to me. I could dig into that trunk that I keep them in and find them all of these years later. 54 years ago? 54 years later. I still have all... Now, how many watermelons have grown in that trunk? None. I want you to know my grandmother, who came across the United States in a covered wagon and was born in Choctaw Indian Nation, she would be ashamed of me. She would say, Eric, you should have been planting one of those seeds. I mailed you those seeds so that you would plant them. What kind of good are those seeds going to be doing in that old trunk of yours? But that's where they're at. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, if you have a seed and you leave it out there by itself and you don't plant it in the ground and let it die, nothing's going to happen. It's going to be like those watermelon seeds that Pastor Eric has in his drawer. But when you plant it in the ground and it dies, it breaks forth, and it's not a death, it's a transformation. And it comes to the soil, and many seeds come from it. And it grows, and it produces a crop that reaches out to a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it. For eternity. We get to choose. You love your life in this world, you're going to lose it. This is it. This is your reward. Enjoy it. Revel in it. Celebrate the paganness of it. This is who you are. This is everything you've worked at, and this is that. Don't imagine anything else. But if you long for something more, it says, those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. How much does it say you should care for the, your life in this world? There's a hard word, isn't it? That's a really hard word. How many of you really thought carefully about what you dressed this morning in before you came to church? I did. I did. Um, how many of you made sure to brush your teeth and floss and those kind of things before you came in? How many of you uh, made sure to wash your hair and comb and that kind of stuff? I did. You know why? Because we care. That's why. Because we didn't want to walk into church and stink the joint up. We didn't want to walk into church and people say, didn't Eric wear that yesterday and the day before 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 and the day before? And the day before? We didn't, I mean, imagine, that's what Jesus did. Every day, the same old robe. Every day, the same old robe. Every day, the same old robe. And what does the scripture say if you have two robes? Give one of them to someone who doesn't have one. How many of you have more than two robes at home? Oh, Lord, help us. I mean, we got closets full of stuff. We, we have got closets full of stuff. I've got closets full of stuff, and I've got a ministry that gives stuff away. We care so much and have... Such a difficult time letting go. So it says we'll share Jesus with joy this Easter, first of all, when his glory is greater than our personal fear. When his glory is greater than our personal fear. You see, at some point you have to decide whose glory is more important to you. The glory of God or your glory. Because all too often, our personal fear stands in the way of God's glory. That's the reason we don't invite people to know Jesus. That's the reason we don't invite people. That's the reason we even struggle. Every single person here knows at least 10 people. Every single person here knows at least 10 people who need to come to church on Easter Sunday. Every single person here 
knows at least 10 people that you can lean on harder than I'm leaning on you. That you can say, you know what, I don't ask much of you. I am asking this of you. I want you to be with me on Easter. Every single one of us can go through that. And if you don't know 10 people, you need to be in church more often so you can know 10 people. I want you to know 10 people. Debbie's parents were living in a little town called Navarre, Ohio, 24 years ago. They wanted to be closer to family and to know more than 10 people, so they moved here so that they could be a part of Central Community. They would come here on vacation, and they wanted to be a part of this. My parents were living in Portola Hills where they could have gone to any church they wanted to in their 70s. And in their 70s and their 80s, they drove an hour every single Sunday for 20 years to sit in church here. People say, oh, it's such a strain. I don't want to put a burden on them. Tippy's parents moved from Ohio to come to church here. My parents drove every week from Orange County to come to church here for 20 years. What kind of strain can you put on someone for Easter Sunday to give glory to God? Why? Because now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. If this is the time, we should celebrate it, and we should make sure we go out of the way. I love what George Burns says. You, how, how many of you don't know who George Burns is? Anyone doesn't know? You know George, George Burns. He was great, wasn't he? Classic. I mean, in his older days, he ended up being God. You know, I mean, he actually ended up being God. When we were kids, that was not who, I mean, my mom didn't like us watching George Burns on TV. She thought he was crass. I mean, we were not supposed to watch him, but I love this quote. He says, happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. And, you know, I, that's such great George Burns, but I think that's a, what a lot of us feel about church. I mean, happiness is having a really nice, warm, loving church that I don't have to go to. They, they, you know, it's over there that we always know is going to be there. It's always gonna, they're always going to be around. I always love the people who come to church, you know, once or twice a year. And they'll say to me, whatever happened to Emma Gagnon? Whatever happened to Sylvia? Whatever happened? And they'll go through life. Well, you know, they went home to heaven. You're kidding me. Yeah, they, well, I didn't get to see them. Nobody told me. Yeah, well, you weren't here. Oh, I would have loved to have seen them. Yeah, they would have loved to have seen you too. They would have loved to have been a part of what's happening. You see, we miss out on so much when we choose not to say that his glory is more important than my personal fear. And this family isn't something that I want to be far away from me. His family is what I want to be very, very close to me. Secondly, we'll share Jesus with joy this Easter when our pride is dead and his truth rules in our lives. When our pride is dead and his truth rules in our lives. And I don't know which rules in your life. I, I think I could take a pretty safe guess whether it's his truth or your pride. But for most of us, the truth of the matter is it's our, our pride still rocks. Our pride still takes first place it says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. For those of you who have lost a loved one to Alzheimer's, you know what it's like to watch that happen. Um, watching my mom in the last years of her life die of Alzheimer's was just, it was horrible. Monday, Debbie's mom had the best day you can imagine. It was the best day. She could still talk a little bit. She looked beautiful laying in bed. They told us it's going to, she's really within hours. We can barely register a pulse, barely find a heartbeat. She looked beautiful. And we were praising God, oh, Lord, this is going to be awesome. Please let her slip away. It was days before she went. It was two and a half more days. And, and we looked back on that Monday thinking, well, why not that day? And that's the way it was with my mom. I mean, except it was years. We thought, well, why not that year instead of these years where she hasn't known anybody? And a friend of mine, she gave her mother a gift when she had her first child, and it was called Grandma's Memories. And it was a journal book for her mom just to take pictures of her grandchildren, her first grandchild, and then she had other grandchildren, and to journal about the grandchildren, kind of like a baby book for each one of her grandchildren. 
And she did it. She kept it copiously. She took all the pictures. And a few months ago, her mom went into sudden onset Alzheimer's. And they were struggling with, well, how do we continue to connect with mom? And they got out her mom's own book. And she says, mom now sits for hours reminding herself of her good life and her own stories with the stories that she wrote down in her own hand with the stories that she released, the pictures that she took with her grandchildren. Have you done that in your relationship with the Lord? To push pride aside, or have you just become that forgetful person? Do you have an Alzheimer's of faith? And somehow allowed the world to take hold over what you surrendered fully at the cross to Christ Jesus. You see, until that pride is dead and truth rules, we can't genuinely celebrate, it remains alone. Third, we'll share Jesus with joy this Easter when faith from deep within us breaks through. At some point, our faith just has to break through. At some point, we just absolutely have, it says, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. We get lots of donations around the church. A um, friend of mine recently, don I, I don't even know exactly who it was, but they donated a whole bunch of blankets and sheets, brand new sheets. And in them was this really cool box that said Bell and Hal on it. I had no idea what it was. So I open it up, and there's this awesome LED light that pops up. It's got a battery that you can hook it inside the trailer, a Jackson for Jesus trailer, so it just batteries right up to the roof and all that kind of stuff. That's going to be incredible. And on top of that, I open it up, and when I open it up, the best thing about it for me was this. Stupid plastic stuff all over the place. Um, I open it up because it hangs, and it's got this LED light, and it's got batteries, so you can hook it to the trailer, and it just hangs down. But I unscrewed the bottom, and there are magnets, I should say, so it hooks up and there were no batteries in it. And I thought, this is going to make a great illustration how you can have an incredible light, but just be without your batteries. And without that incredible light, have it work. And then I thought, no, you know what? I've got batteries in my office. I'm going to put batteries in it. So I got here this morning. I reached in my drawer to get those batteries, and I got them out. I thought, I'm going to put those in. And I open it up, and it takes four batteries, not two. <laughs> I can't tell you how disappointed I was to only have two Kirkland batteries as opposed to the four that I needed. And then I realized, that, have any of you ever woke up in the morning and felt about two batteries shy of a light? I mean, you've woke up in the morning and you've thought, you know, I think I'm still two batteries shy of inviting ten people for Easter, Pastor Eric. I, I'm maybe, in fact, I'm three batteries shy. I just, it's just not there. It's just not there. And I don't know about you, but I feel that way some days. I mean, there are days where it just, my faith just not pumping out the way it needs to be. It's just not happening. I mean, I felt like people were blaming us for Debbie's mom not dying. Debbie's mom, she did not want to come home for hospice care, and it broke Debbie's heart. Debbie begged her to come home for hospice care. Debbie begged her to have the hospital bed, and she said, no, this, the Magnolia, um, nursing care center over here on Magnolia where she had spent the last year of her life after she'd fallen at home. She lived with us four years before that. Um, she said she wanted to go back to her room and her roommate there. But in the last couple of weeks, we've seen why as we've been so many, so much, many hours just with her. In the last week since she's been back from the hospital, every staff member there has come in to spend time with her, to hug her, to cry with her, and to tell her how much they loved her, tell us how much she meant to her, them, and how moving it was to each one of us, but it made me feel guilty, because they would all say the same thing, you know, she's supposed to be gone by now. Have you given her permission to leave? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, have you openly told her, Mom, it's okay if you go, yeah, we told her that. Is there anybody she's waiting for? No, we've already invited everyone from around family, family's flown in from all around the country. 
You're sure there's nothing else? You're pretty doggone sure. We've covered all of our bases here. And we just felt like, geez, I wish these people would quit bugging us about this. We don't want mom to drag through this any more than they do. And I've never been a big believer on that kind of stuff. But everyone pushed it so much. And you say, Pastor Eric, you're pushing it so much about us having faith to invite some people. But man, imagine getting to that point that you didn't invite that person. And that faith, it needs to be from deep within. It needs to break through because its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. So the great gift of Easter is hope, Christian hope, which makes us have that confidence in God, in his ultimate triumph, and in his goodness and love, which nothing can shake. Do you have that hope within you today? Do you have that Christian hope? A confidence in God that nothing can shake? Not even the world, your friends, not any issue, there's nothing that can shake it. You long for them to know that. And so forth, we'll share Jesus with joy this Easter when letting go becomes a daily discipline for growth. When letting go becomes a daily discipline for growth. Mom, up until the very end, every single month, made sure that she paid one bill if every other bill was not paid. It was her insurance on her funeral policy. She wanted to make sure that she wasn't a burden on anybody else. She wanted to make sure that that was covered. When we went to the mortuary to take care of everything, Bill, a guy who I've done lots of funerals with, my parents went through there when they died, Debbie's dad went through there, I told him, this is the end of our business with you, buddy. <laughs> I said, this is it. I'm not coming back. He said, well, what about the two of you? He said, have you taken care of your policy for your children? I looked at him. I said, you know what? We've taken care of them for years. They can take care of us when the time comes. That's it. They said, well, you know, your parents were so good at all this. I said, not worried about it. Not worried about it. You're serious. Absolutely Serious as a heart attack, I have given my life in service and making sure they know everything. When it comes time for me to die, God bless them. They can put me on the boat, they can push me overboard, and that's it. It doesn't matter to me one lick, because I've given my life so that they might know in my letting go as a daily discipline for growth. You see, for each of us, there comes a time, imagine these Greeks Jesus is saying, you're thinking to yourself, Pastor Eric, I don't understand, and you've been going to church for years. You're thinking to yourself, Pastor Eric, I struggle with this. Are you sure this is what it means? And you've read the Bible for years. Some of you walked in with your Bible underneath your hands. And if you didn't, take one of the Bibles here home with you and have it so you can start reading it. But it's essential for us to understand. He says, those who love their life in this, this world will lose it. And we, wait a second. We struggle with that now. And those Greeks were hearing it for the first time, right when they just met this guy. We want to meet Jesus. Philip went to Andrew. Andrew went to Jesus. Jesus says, now's the time. And then he said, those who love their life in this world will lose it. The Greeks must have thought, Lord, help us. This guy gets right to the chase. He didn't wait to meet them. He didn't wait to get to know them. He didn't wait to have a better relationship with him. He cut right to the chase. Is there someone you need to cut right to the chase with? Is there someone you need to tell your story to? What's it mean to let go on a daily basis as part of your discipline? I love what Billy Graham said. The Christian life is not a constant high. He said, I have my moments of deep discouragement. I have to go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes and say, oh God, forgive me or help me. Who said that? Billy Graham. Are you guys like way ahead of Billy Graham in your faith? If you're feeling like I still need to get on my knees and say, oh, Jesus, help me. Oh, Jesus, forgive me. You're in good company. It's called letting go on a daily basis. This morning I told the story of um, 
living in a cave and what it meant for me to come out of the cave that I'd been living in on my two minutes of motivation, my motivated two minutes, my daily um, motivational on YouTube. But when I was done, I thought, yeah, you know, maybe 20 people, 30 people are going to watch this today. This is what I thought about. Last week, I encouraged everyone to go home and tell their story on YouTube. Then I realized what I didn't tell you is what you need to do. Every one of you owns a smartphone, or every one of you knows how to sign on to YouTube, is you need to go on there, and you need to hold that smartphone in front of you, and you need to record your testimony of how you found Christ Jesus. When you found Christ Jesus, the life you had been leading before, and how your life changed, and then you need to upload that to YouTube. You see, I hear people complain all the time about pornography being the biggest thing on YouTube. You know what actually is the new fastest thing on YouTube? Even bigger, it was van life. It's called ASMR. It's people who go to YouTube to watch and listen to people whispering. And I'm not, they just whispering, people who scratch against paper. People who stir paint. And people who are struggling with anxiety at night. And you laugh, but I know some of you are doing it because these videos are getting hundreds of millions of views. And at night, before people go to bed, they'll turn on a video of someone stirring paint. And that's all they're doing is stirring paint. Of someone just holding a ping pong ball and rolling it in their fingers. Of someone... And those are now some of the most popular videos. Now, we laugh about it, and we think, who would be crazy enough to watch that? But what if Christians aren't sharing their testimony on YouTube? You know how much money it costs for you to put a video on YouTube? Zero. Zero. And you know how long YouTube will keep it there? Forever. Long after you're dead. Your testimony can be there for your children, for your grandchildren, for your great-grandchildren, for your great-great-grandchildren, for your nieces, for your nephews, for all of your neighbors. You can put a link on it to Facebook. You can say, in case I never told you between now and Easter, I want you to know, here's my story. And you can say, you know what, I'm going to quit complaining about the negative side of these things and the craziness that's going on there. Instead, I'm going to take it over for God. Now imagine if every single Christian on the planet Earth decided to do that. People would be signing on to YouTube, and all they'd hear is Patty's testimony. All they'd see is Steve's testimony. All they, and they'd search, and they'd say, well, that's not what I want to see today. But it would be flooded with the billion Christians around the world who all decided to put their testimony on YouTube. Why should we invite someone to church at Easter? Because the whole world knows at Easter. Try walking into Big Lots today and not figuring out that it's Easter. Try walking into Target today and not figuring out that it's Easter. Except try walking in and thinking, oh, it's, oh Easter's about the Easter bunny. Easter's about the colored eggs. Easter's about the basket. Easter's about Christ Jesus being born. And that means we need to let go. And finally, fifth, we'll share Jesus with joy this Easter when his promise eternal energizes us with his love. When his promise eternal, because the promise of God, you see, it's eternal, friends. The promise of God, it began a long time ago, and it's eternal. It's the reason children can let go of their parents. It's the reason when 9.30, when we're out at National Cemetery, my, my mother-in-law hated funerals. She didn't come to them at church. If she loved her loved ones and they died and she didn't show up at their funerals, it wasn't because she didn't love them. Because she had buried a son, she had buried a grandson. She just couldn't bring herself to go to him anymore. And so we're not having a church funeral for him. We're going out to National Cemetery at 9.30 Tuesday morning. And you're more than welcome if you love Shirley. You're more than welcome. We'll gather together at the house afterwards, and you're more than welcome at that. I'm sure Debbie would appreciate your presence. But you see, more importantly than that is that his promise is eternal. And we can let go knowing that whether the funeral's here at church or out there at National Cemetery, God's there. And his promise, eternal, it energizes us with his love. It says, those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. 
those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. It was about 4 o'clock in the morning. They had just taken Debbie's mom's body away. And those of you who have been in this spot, you know what that's like. And now both of my parents were gone, and both of Debbie's parents were gone, and I'm feeling this strange sense of, well, I guess we're next. I mean, there's, there's not a buffer zone anymore. You know, before, there was always a buffer zone between us and death. And, you know, it was, it was that next generation, but now we are the next generation. We're it, with no buffer zone anymore, no one in between. We started the notification of family across the country. And I got a text message back from my niece in Ohio, and it just said this. You know what day this is, don't you? And I thought for a minute, April 4th, what day is this? It was the day that her younger brother, my mother-in-law's youngest grandchild, had died. She had been waiting for something. She had been waiting to go on the same day as Dustin. Dustin, who at just 26 years old, died a tragic death and literally ripped my mother-in-law's heart out to the point that she couldn't go back to her home state any longer. She felt like she could barely even see any of her family anymore because everything brought Dustin back to heart in his loss. And on the same exact day, literally within hours of the time, after the doctors thought she should have been gone days sooner, mom was gone. Courtney, her granddaughter, just said to me, Uncle Eric, you know what day this is, don't you? I'd forgotten completely. Mom hadn't. Somewhere deep within the recesses of whatever happened spiritually, there was now a release, and she was going home. I don't know what heaven's like, but I like the image of grandmas and grandchildren being reunited. I like the image of family being together again. I don't know if that's what it's really like, but more importantly than that, I like the knowledge of knowing that today I live on this side of the promise eternal. I live on this side of making sure if there's one grandma out there that doesn't know Jesus, if there's one Dustin, one grandson out there who doesn't know Jesus, I have between now and Easter to do everything I can to make sure that they're invited. I have between now and Easter to make sure that whatever we can do, we will do. To say, I've been lifted up, not just because, not just because God wanted to lift me up, but I've been lifted up to share Jesus. Are you sharing Jesus? I feel sorry for the people who are around me these days. There's no one that I'm, not talk that I'm talking to these days that I'm not saying to at the end of the conversation, where are you going to church for Easter? A friend came over to visit Debbie yesterday, and she brought Debbie the beautiful orchid. She brought her a card. Now, these are friends of ours that don't go to church. And after they hugged together, and Debbie's friend and her, they cried together and stuff, I reached out my hand and said, Cindy, where are you going to church for Easter? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Eric, we don't go to church. Yeah, but it sure would be great if you and Pat were in church with us on Easter. We sure would love it. I check out from the store, and I'm leaning out as I pay for my creamer for my coffee. And I'm just curious, where are you going to church for Easter? I feel so, I'm like an armed weapon for the Savior right now as we're going into Easter. And I want to invite you to be the same, and it's not because... I'm trying to build a great church. I want you to know God's church is already great. I couldn't make God's church great if I tried. He already did that on the cross. My goal is to make sure that there's no one out there between now and Easter that doesn't know that here at Central Community, they are welcome. Why? Because his time has now come to be glorified. Maybe you've been just waiting for something until you'd be weaponized for the Lord. Maybe it was this moment. Simple prayer at the bottom of the card. It says this, 
says, help me glorify you, Jesus, in everything I say and do. Give me courage to surrender my life, every bit of me, to you. Plant me, Lord. Use me to bring others to you this Easter. Thanks. Heavenly Father, we lift ourselves up before you this morning, and some of us have felt a couple batteries shy of a full light, God. Some of us have felt like we've got all the tools, but just not the brightness. And Holy Spirit, I would ask that you would come this morning and that you would fill us with your power, with your enthusiasm, with your energy. This answer seems like such a long, complex answer to just a couple of guys who said they wanted to meet you, Jesus. This answer seems so full in so many ways. And even still, 2,000 years later, we struggle with incorporating it into our hearts and our homes and our lives, God. Help none of the stuff that we've put in the way of this answer to be our struggle, God, but help whatever we need to surrender today, God, that we could surrender. Whatever pride that we put between us and you, God, that we could let go of it, and whatever glory that we've longed to claim for ourselves, God, that we could give it over to you. And we could embrace the desire, Father, to be exactly who you want us to be every day, God, and if not for the rest of our lives, between now and Easter, God, is just this time of seeing what it's like to surrender completely when the world is open to being invited, God, when the hearts and homes of our friends know that it's Easter, we would ask that you would make us the ones who are willingly and openly sharing you, God, as we come into it. And Lord Jesus, for that one who's here this morning who doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, for that one who's here who, like the Greeks, just came wanting to meet Jesus, Holy Spirit, I would ask that you would come in right now, that as their hearts feel strangely warmed, that they might say yes to you, Jesus, and they might be changed for all eternity, that they might become the person that you long them to be, Father, that they might die and new hope spring forth in a great harvest of souls. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be together today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.